everybody. This is uh, Jeremy Schmarman. I am the founding director of the Ataxia Center at Massachusetts General Hospital here in Boston. I am very pleased to join you for the virtual uh, annual members meeting. And uh, we're going to talk today about the topic of cognition, emotion, and the PROM ataxia. So just uh, as we get started, uh, the, the, the standard the disclaimer from NAF, uh, my own disclosures are that I will be mentioning some of the scales that are copyrighted to Massachusetts General Hospital. And I'm going to dive right in. Uh, I'll be going through this. this, the print of this is small, so I'll be blowing this up as we go. But I'm going to start with the patient reported outcome measure of ataxia or the PROM ataxia. This was published uh, just a, a, about a year ago. Um, and this was done in collaboration with the National Ataxia Foundation and many of the folks who are actually on this call. Now, the background to the PROM ataxia is, as you may have heard me say before, that patients and families are our research collaborators. We cannot do this work without you. Uh, you are the experts by experience because you are living through the disease yourselves. And what has become apparent in the field, both for clinical care and for uh, research studies, is that we need to understand from you who are going through these issues, what it is that you're experiencing and allow you to gra grade the different problems that you're having to give us a sense of how you're doing over time and possibly how you do in response to intervention. So the PROM ataxia has become a front and center all of a sudden in both the clinical care and the management and the research studies in, these, uh, in the ataxias, starting with the spinal cerebellar ataxias, but moving to the others as well. Now, the way that we came up with this, as we discussed a year ago, was that we came to you at one of the earlier NAF meetings and we asked you to tell us all the symptoms that you are experiencing as part of the ataxia. We took the many thousands of symptoms you had, we grouped them into these different categories with three overarching domains of physical, mental health, and activities. And I'll go through these and with you in detail. And where we'll end up in the, at the end of the talk is a recognition that in the mental health domain that you told us about, almost 20% of the symptoms that you were experiencing were in the mental health domain. So when I talk about the cognition and emotion later in the, in the talk, I want to frame this as a fact that we are uh, reflecting what people are telling us and we are respecting the fact that these problems are going on. This has relevance for how we understand ataxia, how we understand how it affects people who have ataxia and their families, it increases our understanding of these problems and allows us to think about how we can intervene to improve quality of life. So that's how I'm going to frame a conversation of what can sometimes be seen as a difficult conversation about changes in what has not been thought to be a cerebellar problem, that is, issues with intellectual functioning, fine-tuned uh, mental processing, and some of the emotional disorders that we see in people who have cerebellar troubles. Let's jump right into the primary tax here. And the first one is the physical section. Uh, the sections one and two determined by the uh, two uh, analyses, either uh, frequency or severity. This is the frequency issue. So here are the questions that we put together after a whole series of studies based on what you told us uh, to see whether people can understand the scale, how good are the questions, uh, do they reflect your problems that you're noticing, how relevant are they to you, uh, and how do these questions tie up to other studies, other scales that tap into problems in the ataxia? So here they are. I feel like steady on my feet when standing or walking. I lose my balance on uneven surfaces. Uh, I, can, uh, I may lose my balance and fall. I mean, that's a concern that may happen to me. I do lose my balance on stairs, ladders, and step stools. I'm clumsy. I'm stumbling or falling. I have trouble controlling my arms or I have shaking in my hands. I have shaking my hands at rest and when I do things, I have some sensory symptoms, tingling pins and needles or loss of sensation, muscle stiffness and cramps, slurring of speech, people are having trouble understanding what I'm saying. So people are actually noticing that there's a problem. I have difficulty swallowing and I cough or choke when I eat or drink. I have double vision or blurred vision, I have trouble with depth perception and judging how far something is from me, I have trouble with my bladder, trouble with my bowels, trouble falling asleep, difficulty staying asleep, uh, trouble by fatigue, uh, spinning sensations of vertigo, 
loss of sex drive, or the condition interferes with the ability to engage in sexual activity. So that is the physical section, uh, first part, for with the from never to always. And the next is how much trouble do you have with these problems? I can carry things in my arms while walking. Do you have any problem, or can you do it fine, or do you have some difficulty, a lot of difficulty, or you just can't do it? You can walk without assistance. You can catch yourself or prevent a fall and stumbling. You can engage in any sport that you like. You can bend down and pick something off the floor. If you're on the floor, you can get up without help. You can roll over in bed. You can perform fine uh, motor control with your hands. You can control your arms. You can write legibly, and you can type on a keyboard. So these are the physical features that people tell us about as being impaired in their tax year. And the gradation is, do you have any problem uh, at all? Or is it totally fine? Or if you have a problem, how much problem do you have? And that's part of the fine-tuned analysis of motor control. In terms of activities of daily living, the question here is, can you do your job? Can you do housework? Can you uh, go in the garden and do what you like to do in the garden? Can you shop on your own? Can you drive? Can you get in and out of a car? Can you take public transport? Can you cook? Can you handle the utensils? Can you dress yourself without difficulty? Can you move around the house? Take a shower, brush your teeth, shave, get in and out of bed, get into the bathroom, get enough to toilet yourself? These are the activities of daily living that are degraded in people who have the cerebellar ataxias. And then finally, is the mental section. These are the symptoms that people told us about that we then turned around into questions for you to grade from either never to always or no difficulty to unable to do. And this includes, this first part is mostly emotional systems. I have feelings of being sad, down or depressed. I can be irritable, short-tempered and impatient. I've lost interest in activities I used to enjoy. I have a hard time controlling my emotions. Anxiety, worry and stress affect my activities. I have experienced a lower drive and motivation to get things done. I feel isolated. My condition impacts my social interactions with family and friends. I become anxious in groups of people, and I feel subconscious or embarrassed in the public setting. And then in the cognitive domain, in terms of thinking and concentrating, I, have, uh, I can think of words I want to say in conversation. Do you have troubles, or uh, is it impaired? Is it, how, how much of a problem is it? I can remember conversations or people or things I've done or planned. I'm able to multitask with physical activities and or mental tasks. I can learn new skills. I can make quick decisions accurately and well. I can comprehend things I've I read or I've heard, and I can follow directions and navigate well. So these are the 70 questions in the prometaxia. They don't take long to go through. Once you read them, you'll have a sense of how you're doing. And then we have a total score for each of the subsections and a total prometaxia score. This has now been translated into about 15 languages, so it's been used around the world. It's already been used in clinical trials and the natural history studies. And how it uh, manifests, how, how it reflects how the diseases are manifesting in people with ataxia is going to be really powerful information for, for you to know how things are going, for us who are taking care of you, for the research projects where we're trying to figure out if new medicines work. And I think the FDA. Uh, which de determines whether medicines are going to be effective or not, is going to be relying on the patient reported outcome. Uh, in other words, what is your experience? How significant is a new medication for you as you work through these uh, troubles that you have in the ataxias? Let's talk then a bit about the mental and uh, the, the cognitive and emotional piece of the prometaxia, 19% of the symptoms that people told us about in the uh, troubles that they reported. Well, this is because of what we described now a long time ago, the cerebellar cognitive affective syndrome back in 1998. It's almost 25 years. Uh, where we described a problem with executive function, which is planning and verbal fluency, how you find words to say, <clears throat> mental flexibility called set shifting, abstract reasoning, how you can uh, think in an abstract way and working memory, holding information in mind to be able to do something uh, with that newly held information. Uh, spatial cognition is a way to get at uh, the big picture thinking in life. It has focused on visual spatial awareness and visual spatial memory, but in a way, it's a, in a sense of, of how one gets uh, one's brain and oneself around big picture concepts. Uh, so the language deficits are a little different than the kind of language problems in somebody with a stroke, 
this is difficulty with uh, organizing thoughts into a clear stream of logical processing with language. How do you form the grammar? Is there modulation in your tone of voice? Can you find words to say? And this taps into something else we call metalinguistics, which is how you use language to communicate, um, knowing about abstract thinking and uh, how one uses words for humor or for sarcasm or for irony, for getting information across, how you use language to communicate. And this touches on the notion of social cognition, which gets you into the affective piece of the cognitive affective syndrome, changes in personality, where the affect is a little blunted, and there may be some disinhibition or behavior may be a, uh, not quite appropriate for the context. And then the eponym from my, my colleagues here uh, has the, the statement that the cognitive affective syndrome is a third cornerstone of what's called clinical ataxiology, the other two being the motor control and the vestibular system. We looked a little further at the uh, neuropsychiatry of cerebellum, the affective piece. And what we uh, were able to identify from patients <clears throat> in our clinic and from family members who are working with these uh, people with ataxia, both adults and children, is that there are a variety <clears throat> of neuropsychiatric symptoms, excuse me, that can impair the way that we are thinking about ourselves, interacting <clears throat> with our colleagues, interacting with our family, uh, how we're doing at work. And this includes five domains of behavior we call attentional control, emotional control, autism spectrum, psychosis spectrum, and social skill set. And they break down into two categories is the way that we frame this. Uh, one where there's uh, distractibility or hyperactivity, or the other where people are unable to uh, shift their focus and they're obsessional in their thoughts and, and uh, unable to move from one topic to another kind of perseveration. The emotional control includes impulsivity and disinhibition. Uh, the feelings may be incongruous, there may be agitation and anxiety, or the opposite side, they may be flattened and down and helpless and sad. The autism spectrum, we tend to see more in the kids, but it includes kind of stereotypical behaviors, repetitive behaviors, sometimes self-stimulation behaviors, avoiding uh, stimuli, uh, including tactile, so, um, stimuli like touch or certain kinds of tastes or smells or clothing, and then an easily sensory uh, overloaded uh, in these environments. The psychosis spectrum includes either illogical thought or paranoia, sometimes even hallucinations, and sometimes a lack of empathy uh, or, or an inability to be present emotionally uh, and in, in a way that gives other people a sense that you understand what they're going through. And this lack of empathy and emotional blunting can be a real a wrecker of uh, close personal interaction. The social skill set includes uh, angry or aggressive behavior or irritability or being oppositional on the one hand, and then an overly passive or immature childish kind of behavior. If people have difficulty with social cues or aren't quite aware of the social boundaries are part of how we interact with each other, and sometimes even overly gullible and trusting, which can be a problem. Of, in terms of one's own self-preservation. Now, uh, I'm going to just show you a couple of pieces of data that are relevant directly to the uh, spinal cerebellar ataxia patient community. We developed a cognitive affective syndrome scale a few years ago to be able to quantify the changes we see in the cerebellar cognitive affective syndrome. And without going into too much detail, which is uh, cognitive neuroscience, what we have is ways, these different domains of trouble to come up with a total score and a pass-fail score on this test. So this is directed at the kind of troubles we see in the cerebellar people, the cerebellar patients. And uh, the total score is how one does on each of these different uh, scales, the different domains. And each of these has been normed. We know what a, a healthy control person would look like. And we know where the, uh, where the trip lines are for if one's actually failing each of these different uh, 10 subcomponents of the scale. There's a total score, and we find that if you fail three of these, of these 10 different domains, that uh, differentiates, at least in the original study, differentiated people who have a cerebellar a disease of some kind from people who have no neurological trouble. So this scale also has been translated into many languages now, and it's been used 
to understand cognition and emotion in uh, cerebellar diseases. This is a work that is in progress. It's in preparation now. It's part of the Macklin Foundation support for the National Ataxia Foundation. It's in con a collaboration with the uh, CRCSCA, the Clinical Research Consortium for the Study of Cerebellar Ataxias, and the REDI-SCAR study, the study of, of selected ataxias, both presymptomatic and early stage disease. And Louisa Sauvet, who's our fellow, uh, is leading this project with us. In looking at the database from the CRC and the REDI-SCAR, we had 309 people we could look at who had the cognitive affective syndrome scale, uh, including SCS 1, 2, 3, 6, 7, and 8. And we had uh, 37 controls who were entered into ReadyScar not knowing if they had the gene test or not. So that's how we have the controls in this patient group. Now, there is a false positive rate that about 5% of the controls actually failed the cognitive affective syndrome uh, uh, test uh, indicating that maybe they have definite CCAS. So uh, this is something that we're working on to try and decrease that, but it's pretty low, uh, a false positive rate. But given that, all the SCAs combined had a, a score of about 46% of people who are meeting criteria for the cerebellar cognitive affective syndrome with some variation in the different SCAs themselves. So this again, going back to the top, this is both reflecting and respecting patient experience with ataxia. And we can't any longer ignore this and have your doctors or other doctors say, oh, this is just in your head, you're just imagining it, maybe you're just depressed about the problems that are going on. Uh, this is important for us to pay attention to because if you don't know about it, we can't work with it and we cannot help you to try and make quality of life better. There is a range of performance within these different SCAs across the cognitive testing. So the cognitive affective syndrome scale has a raw score, which is out, out of 120, where below 82 is an absolute fail on the raw score. This is our control group. Uh, everybody was above the passing score. We actually have some pre-symptomatic SCA1 and SCA3s. The couple are uh, not doing so well, but it's not that much different from the controls, but you start to get into significant, statistically significant differences in the people who have the ataxias. And you can see that whereas there are some folks doing just fine, other ones are already having some trouble uh, uh, in failing the uh, total raw score of the cerebellar cognitive affective syndrome scale. Now, where I want to take you next is to give you a sense of why is this happening? Now, some of you have seen these slides before. I'll just show you a few of them just to give you a sense of uh, what is this all about? How can cognition and emotion not part of the ataxia spectrum? So this is the cerebellar aptus from a number of years ago. We know about where in the cerebellum things are. We can label the different parts of cerebellum and the, the, log, the fissures, the spaces in, that differentiate one lobule from another. And the important point to recognize is that most of the human cerebellum consists of the, the posterior lobe back here. Uh, so the anterior lobe is in front of the red line, which is called the primary fissure, and the rest of the cerebellum is a posterior lobe, which has expanded massively through evolution. And when you put people, healthy people, into a scanner and you have them do things, uh, they move their, or their hands or they do some language tasks or they look at some spatial cognition tasks or working memory, we see, both in a meta-analysis, looking at many studies uh, over the years previously, uh, a single person, and then a group uh, of people that we looked at prospectively with our, our Catherine Studley and Eve Valera a few years ago, we see that there is a motor cerebellum, as you would have expected, but language activates a cerebellum, spatial cognition activates cerebellum, and working memory activates a cerebellum. And within a single individual, as this is, you can actually identify, and we showed this, this is now you know, 13, 14 years ago, you can identify motor regions and spatial regions and language regions and executive working memory regions. Now, this has been taken to uh, patients with stroke because if you have a stroke in the cerebellum in the top part, and we call the anterior lobe, you have the cerebellar motor syndrome. But if you look down at the bottom of the cerebellum, down here in the posterior lobe, in the different sections that you can look at the posterior lobe, these people do not have motor ataxia. They have the cerebellar cognitive affective syndrome only. So there's a real discrepancy between the anterior lobe motor and the posterior lobe cognitive. 
And then this idea was taken further uh, just a, a few years ago when you have people who are scanned multiple times across a group of healthy, healthy folks. And if you flatten out the cerebellum, it's a bit of a strange picture, but it's a flattened cerebellum. Here is the anterior lobe up the top. And what you see is that these green marks are the motor control. And the second representation is how we think about it down here in a part called lobule eight. But all the rest of the cerebellum is activated by uh, attention and language comprehension and memory systems and emotional processing. Uh, it's a much different landscape of what's going on down here. And uh, this is because there is a patterning, a patterning of, of connections and functions within the cerebellum. So a fellow called Randy Buckner a few years ago looked at what's called resting state connectivity. And our students, Xavier Grell, did the same thing with a very large uh, number of, of uh, people looked at in healthy controls in a national study called the Connect Arm Project and looked at task activation when you lie in the scan and doing things or just seeing how the brain is wired up. And what these blobs of color show is that for motor activation, where if you're moving your tongue, both when you activate the, the tongue and when you look at the connection between the uh, cerebellum and the cerebral hemispheres, there are activation areas which are regarded as primary and secondary motor representations. But when you have people do language tasks or tests of working memory, how you hold information in mind to manipulate, manipulate the information, or social cognition tasks or emotion tasks, you spare the anterior lobe and you have different places in the posterior lobe of the cerebellum where these activations are represented. So it turns out to be what's called a primary, secondary, and tertiary non-motor representation. So in the cerebellum, in the human, we have these different areas that are subserving different functions. So the bottom line of all of this and why it turns out that there are mental, cognitive, emotional issues in the cerebellar uh, diseases, as well as all the ataxia, the, the, the speech and the control of the arms and legs and the walking and the swallowing and the eye movements is because in this flattened view of cerebellum, the schematic of cerebellum, the anterior lobe, which is up here, and a bit of lobe eight down here are the motor cerebellum. But the rest of the human cerebellum, which has expanded massively through evolution, is involved in all those tasks I showed you that are reflected in the cerebellar cognitive affective syndrome, the neuropsychiatry of cerebellum. They come out in the scale and they are come out in what you told us when you shared your symptoms that you're experiencing as part of your cerebellar constellation. And then one more nuance here, it turns out that the midline of cerebellum is more involved in emotional regulation and the more lateral parts on the side are more involved in a high level thinking, abstract reasoning, working memory and so on. So uh, this is a, just to make the point that this is work that is done in collaboration with many uh, colleagues and investigators over the years just to uh, make sure that you know this is not just me out there doing stuff but we have a very uh, strong collaborative group. And then importantly for the work I've showed you with the uh, SCA, the uh, CRC work is the consortia that work together across the US and also now internationally to really have a deep dive into the cerebellar attacks just to understand what's happening. And in the end, to work with you, our research collaborators, to reflect what you're experiencing, to respect the symptoms that you have and pay attention to them, and then to find ways to improve them together with you as we use uh, the scales such as the prometaxia and the cognitive affective syndrome scale, along with the new metrics, the uh, careful evaluation of motor control, uh, the different uh, automated measures and sensors that are coming down, uh, the new biomarkers, all these ways to truly, truly define the experience of a person with ataxia and find ways to improve that as time goes by. So I think I'll stop there and leave time for questions. I look forward to being able to continue the conversation. And uh, thank you very much. I look forward to seeing you all in person next time. Dr. Shmaman, thank you for that great presentation. I'm Andrew Rosen. I'm the executive director at NAF. Uh, we do have uh, some time for questions. I would encourage people to use the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen uh, to ask questions. You can also put them in the chat uh, either way. But we will. Uh, we will get to a few of these. Um, 
Dr. Shaman, I think you can also see the questions. I don't know if you want me to read them to you. Um, what would you prefer here? Uh, there was one that came in that disappeared, so we can find that one again. Yes, uh, and, and there are actually, I, I think two of them are similar. The, the one that disappeared says, can medications for other conditions affect ataxia symptoms or development? For example, medications for depression, anxiety, or ADHD? And if so, how, positive, negative, or other? That's a great question. In fact, at this point, we don't have clinical studies that give us a clear answer as to which medication is proven to work in the symptoms of the cognitive affective syndrome. So what we're doing is we are repurposing medicines for the symptoms of other diseases to help us in the symptoms that people may have with ataxia. So you're exactly right. We can treat depression, you can treat anxiety, you could treat sleep issues, you can treat executive control issues, fatigue. So these are, are approaches to treatment of symptoms derived from other conditions like depression or OCD or anxiety disorder that we can bring to bear in people with cerebellar troubles who are, ha who are having the same conditions. Okay. Um, Maddie Lotz, I think may have asked a kind of a similar question. I don't know if you see that one. Do you want to take, take that one as well? Was that the one about um, how do you distinguish whether someone has ADD from on their yeah. own? How do you differentiate psychiatric symptoms caused by cerebellar diseases or disorders from ADHD or depression that's unrelated? So uh, that's an important question. And the answer, frankly, is we don't know. Um, because if somebody has these other problems that are interfering with life, uh, did they predate the cerebellar difficulties? Do they come along with it? Do they come along after it? Um, the, the way to think about this, and I think it may be helpful, is that the way we think about the way the brain structure and function works together is that there are different regions around the brain all working together to make things happen. And there are different parts of the brain that are involved in similar kind of uh, functions. So they may be involved in similar kind of problems. There may be a few different spots around the brain relevant for depression uh, or for anxiety or for attentional issues. And one of them could be cerebellum as we think it is now, along with other parts of the brain upstairs. So uh, that's a, it's actually a very focused and good question that, that the field needs to work on some more. Okay, thank you. Um, what was the, what, sorry, here's one. What was the delineation used between possible CCAS and probable CCAS in the study? So what's unique about the, the scale, the cognitive effective syndrome scale, is that each of the 10 items, instead of just being added up at the end, is scored for whether somebody who doesn't have a cerebellar problem would pass that particular test or not. So for example, the ability to name animals in a minute, there is a normal range of how many animals somebody can name in a minute. Um, if, you, if you fall below, I think it's uh, maybe 15 or, or so, I can look it up, I've forgotten it. Um, if you fall below a certain number, then uh, that would suggest that there is a problem. So um, the, uh, if, you, if you're above that number, then you passed it. So if you don't pass it, you failed that particular question. Mm -hmm. So each of the 10 items has a pass fail for that particular question. And instead of adding everything up at the end and say that you pass or fail, we can actually get a sense of a granularity of a more detailed understanding of which of these things is someone doing well at, as opposed to which one of they're having problems on. And that way, we get more information about which aspects of brain functioning, intellectual processing, emotional processing, is somebody doing well on and when someone's not doing so well on. If, to answer the question specifically, if you, if you, when in our original study, the people who, who didn't pass three out of 10, everybody who, who, who uh, uh, failed three or more was in the patient group. Nobody in the healthy control group failed three. Okay. What's happening as, as it gets uh, used more widely outside of the Boston area, different ages, different levels of education, we're finding that that may be a little too strict. So there is a failure rate of about 5%. So we're working on that a bit to tighten that, but it still is a, is a good discriminator of somebody who's having problems as opposed to somebody who's not. Okay. That, that's the answer. Whether you prefer one is possible, two is probable, three is definite cognitive affective syndrome, uh, based on how many of those tests you fell out of 10. 
Okay, here's, I think, an interesting one. My motor symptoms appeared four years ago, and so far, none of the mental or, or cognitive effects. Should I be prepared for those effects as the ataxia progresses? I, That's a I great am currently question. unspecified type. That's a great question. So if you remember from the graph that I showed you, there are a lot of people who are doing just fine. So if 46% if, uh, meet criteria for definite CCS, that means over 50% do not. Uh, and in the range of scores that people are, are coming up with, some people are doing just fine. So it does mean that everybody who has a cerebellar problem has a cognitive issues. In the same way that everybody has a stroke in the cerebellum, they don't all have motor issues, depends on where the problem is. Now, your question is, is it going to develop down the road? The short answer is we don't know uh, because it depends on what kind of a problem you're dealing with and not knowing exactly what it is is obviously uh, frustrating and challenging. I think that the, 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 the practical suggestion is that you want to try and remain uh, as vigilant as you can about all those kinds of uh, thinking and emotional and social processes that people pay attention to as they get older. And so being physically active, maintaining social interactions that are emotionally grounding and remaining uh, cognitively challenged is a good way to keep yourself brain healthy along with a good uh, brain, brain and heart healthy diet. So there are some ways to address that because we don't really know for sure, uh, unless you know what the diagnosis is, in which case you can look back on people who've had the, the, the same diagnosis in the past. Uh, but in your situation, I think the, the answer is we don't know. And so to try to place yourself in the best position you can, prepare yourself for uh, running a brain marathon. Yep, okay. How about this one? Um, is it possible for someone to exhibit only neuropsychiatric symptoms and not motor symptoms also? Yes. Short answer is yes. Okay. Depends on where the trouble is. Yep. Okay. Um, let's see here. Um, someone asked if they can share this presentation with their neurologist. <laughs> uh, I think that's the, that's the reason we're doing these things. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and someone asked in the chat about, because uh, I know some of those slides are small depending on the screen size. Um, if you go back to the schedule, uh, in the online platform and, and find this specific presentation or this specific link, um, Jeremy's uh, presentation is, is right there for you to download. So you are welcome to do that. It'll come down to you in a PDF and then you can make it bigger. You could save it and share it with your neurologist. So uh, it's right there in the platform for anyone who is interested. Um, let me see here. Um, uh, someone asked, I saw working memory on the slides. What about long-term memory? Long-term memory, where one uh, remembers things from a long time ago, is very different than working memory. Working memory is also be called scratch pad memory. Uh, it's using information in real time now. So when someone gives you a phone number, you have to remember it, and then you, then you type the phone number. So it's a me memory of something. It's holding something in mind in order to manipulate the information and use it right now. And we test that by the uh, uh, ability to repeat numbers backwards. So working memory turns out to be a challenge as we get older, like why you went into a room to get something, uh, keeping a phone number in mind, remembering that you left something on the stove is important, uh, not getting distracted. Working memory is ability to, to be mindful and in place now, holding information in mind in order to manipulate it. Long-term memory, what goes in Alzheimer's is quite different. That's remembering things that have been stored down from a long time ago. In cerebellar problems, when the, when the trouble is purely cerebellar, long-term memory is generally preserved. People have difficulty sometimes remembering without having their mind, the memory jogged. But you know, as one gets older, that's a problem too. Uh, but uh, one doesn't lose past memory. So it's not a dementing disease like an Alzheimer's. There are conditions that get the cerebellum in which the brain upstairs can be involved. And that's when you can actually have memory troubles. And so we make the point very clearly that if there's long-term memories that are lost, then one has to worry about thinking about, is there something upstairs? And in that, that situation, there are medicines that we use in Alzheimer's, for example, that can be helpful for memory in people who don't have Alzheimer's. So that's, we are repurposing medications from Alzheimer's for other kinds of memory difficulties when it's a long-term memory problem. Okay, great. Um, can you recommend a layman's form of literature on the cerebellum? I'd like to get better acquainted with the cerebellum's, func cerebellum's function. 
Any no, thoughts a lot, on that? A lot is written out there. NAF has some stuff, but I think yep. you just you, you do you what you're saying to me is what my my family tells me all the time is I need <laughs> to write the book, and so I, they're, they're, here. But there are lots of I have lots of lectures on online. You could find them on YouTube and other places, and you can glean stuff from there. More detail than I talked about today. But you but you're absolutely right. I think that this needs to be put into a form that is uh, accessible to people who really need to be able to use the information. So, so thanks for, for, for pushing me in that direction again. Mm -hmm. Here's one in the chat. I continue to have a neurologist tell me SCA3 is not likely to affect cognition or executive function. I'm told those functions are controlled by the prefrontal cortex, as has long been the teaching. Does the brain signal go through both areas as processing, cognition, and executive function? Yes, you've both asked the question and you answered it. <laughs> so that's exactly what's going on. As, as you remember, some of the pictures I showed uh, show blobs of color that are both in the prefrontal cortex and in the cerebellum because the cerebellum is part of that same circuitry. What is different is that what the cerebellum is doing to that information we think is different than what the prefrontal cortex is doing. But damage to the, to the cerebellum, we know now, actually affects those systems that are involved in uh, planning and organizing and strategies and multitasking and uh, working memory, all those things that we've been talking about as executive functions. So this is very much part and parcel of what the cerebellum is doing. And so if somebody wants to uh, show this uh, uh, talk to your, your doctor, or maybe you can send them a, couple, a, a paper or two that uh, uh, NAF has and I can share, share with them, they may, have, may find it interesting to read about what, what, the, what the updated information is about cerebellum because that, that is a very outdated motion. And what bothers me about it is they're not list, the, the, the doctors who are telling you that are not listening to you. Mm. And at this point, that's just annoying. Um, you have a right to be heard. Uh, you are the experts by experience uh, and you need to be heard. And if your doctors don't know, then you could help teach them. Absolutely. No, I... Right, patients are, are their best advocates, there's no question. Um, what types of treatments might perhaps be of some assistance in relation to the cognitive and emotional impacts of ataxias? That's an important question. So I'll tell you this, we, we don't have what we, we would describe as evidence-based medicine for this. So we don't know in a, in a group of people who have these issues, um, what the results of a particular medication would do compared to others. But the work that we're doing now, so the work that I showed you in this talk that's coming out of NAF uh, with our postdoc, uh, Dr. Silvadi Rai, looking at the cognitive affective syndrome scale in people who have ataxia is the kind of database that we need to start looking at this question directly and say, here's what we're identifying. We know what kind of medications we could use. Let's start taking a look. So the, the next the next uh, step forward, I think, is in terms of making life better for people who are dealing with ataxia and all these issues is identify those who have the issues, start a medication, and then see, compared to those who don't take a medication, whether there's any change for the better. And so that's what that's a clinical trial in the cognitive neuroscience space. And I think it's something that we need to start thinking about doing because now we have the tools to do it. We didn't have the tools before. We didn't have the scale. We didn't have the prom. We didn't have the other features. Uh, we didn't. We couldn't prove to ourselves even the kind of question that your doctor is asking you or saying that this is not involved in executive control. Now we have that, so we can actually be in a much better place to take this uh, to a new direction. Okay, great. Um, here's an interesting one that just came in. Who are candidates to take the prom? Anyone diagnosed with ataxia or only those newly diagnosed with an SCA? Would someone with both cognitive and mobility issues and diagnosed 20 years ago? be useful for in any of your studies? So absolutely. The, the, the thing about the PROM is you could take it every, you could take it every couple of weeks. It, it's, it's, not, it's not something that you would get better on with practice because it's asking you about your life. How much trouble do you have doing the following things? Or how much difficulty are you noticing about your writing or your speech or your walking or your balance and so on? So uh, it will be useful. And we have, so again, we have to prove this in a longitudinal fashion, and we're starting to do this, and we'll be doing it with NAF uh, support as well, is uh, proving, we, we, we've, we've proven everything about the PROM, except for its longitudinal change over time, over years, because it was just, just uh, developed last year. Uh, but uh, 
that's uh, that's exactly what it's used for to give us a sense in a quantitative manner of how you're doing over time. And if there's some way to improve uh, the symptoms that you have, it should hopefully show up in the prompt. Great, Jeremy. Let me ask you a, a, a question that I've had. Um, so, the FDA, Food and Drug Administration, that approves uh, drugs in the U.S., um, is is clearly making a concerted effort to try to take the patient voice in more of of their decision making. It it led uh, NAF to help sponsor a patient focused drug development meeting with the FDA that we held a couple of years ago, uh, and it's an important uh, step in in getting your uh, in getting your disease sort of front and center with the FDA. Why, how is the prom, why is the prom important in that uh, versus just simply um, proving that a drug scientifically might make a difference, but what's important maybe is, does it really help the patient? Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, the FDA wants, you know, I, I'm, I don't, I haven't met with the FDA. I don't, I don't uh, know anybody who's on it and I haven't interacted with them uh, personally, but what, what I know they're looking for is, is the so what. Right. That's the bottom line, you give a drug, and you find some ataxia rating scale or some marker improves, so what? What does that mean about the person who's got the illness? And the reason that the problem is important is because you're telling us exactly that you can now do something that you couldn't do before. There's a missing piece, and the missing, and we're actually working on this. The missing piece is, if, if I test, for example, as your doctors, if your doctors watch your walking or your, your heel to shin test, and they find that there's, either worse or better. What we're now doing is we're tying up the examination features with specific elements of the PROM. So we'll be able to say, if you improve your score on an ataxia rating scale and your PROM improves in these particular things, it's making a difference to your life because now you'll say, for example, I can drive on my own. I can go to the store on my own. I can get out of the bed on my own, but before I couldn't, or I'm falling a, you know, once a once a month, whereas before I was falling every day, or well, I need a walker, whereas uh, before now I just I can get around with a cane. So these are elements of the prom that will capture all those aspects of your life, in addition to how your thinking and your mood may be. It's very much a, a 360 degree, so to speak, which we derived from people at NAF back in 2018 uh, to tell us what the issues are in ataxia, and the FDA cares because if that's enough to make a difference to your life, then the, monitor, the measures that we use to get a sense of, from the scientific perspective, is your ataxia getting better, actually has a real world implication for what's going on in your life. That's mm -hmm. why it's simple. Absolutely, great, thank you. Um, we have time for maybe one more. Um, what about not having many memories of your childhood? I'm only 37, but even, even as a late teen, I had this issue. Could that affect memories at, at that young an age? Uh, it's a complicated question. Um, I think that probably needs more more time to think about in terms of the this, this specifics of, of what this person is going through. Um, there, there are many things that, that affect how we remember our childhood. Some are good, some are bad, some are medical, some are not. I think that that's a complicated question. Okay. Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll leave the last word to you, Dr. Schmam. Do you have anything else you want to share with this group? Um, lots of great questions. Um, they'll, I'm sure they'll keep coming in. And, and again, you can download Dr. Schmaman's presentation right from uh, our online platform. Um, anything else you want to add? No, thank you all for being here. And, uh, you know, we're working together. We, we value all of your, I'm sure some people are here who actually took part in the original questionnaire from the prom back in 2018. You can see how far it's come along. Uh, we value our relationship with you, uh, with the National Taxi Foundation. Uh, there's a wonderful collaborative group of ataxia doctors across the country, as you know, and uh, we're all working, pulling together to try and make, make this a, a better world for people who are dealing with cerebellar disorders. Uh, and it's not just people who have inherited ataxias, as you know, it's the, the kids who've had cerebellar tumors or cerebellar hemorrhages or cerebellar strokes or brain trauma with cerebellar troubles. Uh, the other kind of conditions with a cerebellum link like autism and schizophrenia, even Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and ALS all have a cerebellum link. So cerebellum is a, is, a, is a, as I like to say, you know, little brain, big deal. <laughs> Very good. Uh, the thank yous are rolling in in the chat and I echo those. Um, thank you, Dr. Schmaman, for your time and your continued support of the Ataxia community. This will wrap up day two of AAC. Uh, we look forward to our final day tomorrow. We start at 11 a.m. Central Time 
it's going to be a heck of a good day and it ends with the virtual dance party that I know uh, at least I am really looking forward to. So uh, thank you all and we'll, uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Take care now. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, everybody.